met in your back break. We're talking about congestive heart failure and that um, the first symptom is dyspnea and given a cardiogenic drug and then a diuretic. Cardiogenic to make the contraction better. Diuretic is less fluid for it to have to work on. So here's that cardiac patient and doing well, diet's good, exercising, keeping the weight down because that's harder for the heart if the weight's up. And we're pretty proud of them. And they're on a small dose of a, of a um, cardiogenic and a diuretic. And that can work, and it can work great. And they may live 50 years. It's not what usually happens. I, I, I don't know whether you know cardiac patients. It's our nature, we're good at first. You know, you get a, a, a ticket in the car, you're good, you drive good for a while after you go to court. And, uh, but in a while you're doing some similar things that you ever did. And I think it's just the way we are. And so you're good for a while. So traditionally, cardiac patients, their failure just gets a little worse. And um, so their cardiogenic has to be increased and their diuretic has to be increased. And, um, and you know, uh, cardiac patients aren't always obese in their failure state. Th they may not exercise or the familiar, the genetic aspect. Uh, the heart just is going to get weaker because everybody in the family has had a bad heart. So you just have to look at it all. But as your cardiogenic drug is increased over the years and your diuretic, um, um, you wake up one morning, it's not a good thing, but your feet are swollen or your fingers are swollen which now means your failure is worse because the pump can't bring the blood back as good and it's pooling. And it's just a sign the pump is, is letting you down. So the doctor puts you on a better, different cardiogenic drug, a higher diuretic, and that'll work a while. But that's where I'm saying the heart muscle just doesn't usually retrieve. It just basically gets worse, the failure. Um, now, pretty soon though, you are tops on your diuretic and maybe on your cardiogenic drug. And so I told you to kind of close up, but I want you to go to page uh, 22 in briefs, 22 in briefs, and above the word emergency medications, right above that, is xeroxalin. Kathy, I don't know if there's any drug now other than xeroxalin that I'm not familiar. You'd think we'd have another drug. Xeroxalin is just a magic drug. For that patient I was just telling you about, he's, you know, he's had congestive heart failure for 20 years. He's been, he's all right. He hadn't, he's not obese, but periodically it's had to be increased. His diuretic has to be increased. We don't want to deplete his potassium, so we've got to give him potassium. If he's at really a high point, it's usually uh, Lasix 120 or 154 times a day or so. No, it's just ridiculous. The diuretic and how high it is. If they give them xeroxalin, and it's kind of a, not a last ditch, but kind of magic. They just, the fluid just pours off of them. You don't give xeroxalin instead of a diuretic. It enhances a diuretic. And they don't start off with the xeroxalin. It's usually late. So it's just a 
very interesting rug and it's old i mean not old but it's been around a long time and i'm surprised they don't have some new ones except it can't be beat it's just a good drug um and so i think that's what i want to say on congestive heart failure um mm -hmm. now um the stroke or the brain attack or the CVA, whichever you are around that calls it, whatever. Uh, I don't know why we had, they love, they want us to use brain attack uh, for a CVA, but everybody mostly uses stroke or CV, uh, um, or um, CVA. I don't hear the public calling about brain attack, but they wanted us, that's the newest term. Um, and, and you know, it can be three ways that you're, what it amounts to is tissue, um, tissue doesn't get the oxygen and nutrients that it should. And why doesn't it? Because there's a clot, because the vessel has striated so thin, so tiny now, nothing, it's just barely enough blood going through, or it's ruptured. So that Brain attack can be from three different things. And uh, so the clot, it could be athro, it could be a fat clot or a blood clot. It could be tiny strided vessel because barely any blood getting through or a rupture. All three don't get oxygen to the brain. And so the treatment has to be uh, well, the damage is done, and but there's a few things that can be done. I mean, if you're manifesting a brain attack, damage is done. And uh, there's no magic bullet except, and correct me, any, if they get to you and know that's what it is, within a couple, couple of three hours, they can give you a clot buster if, it's, if it is due to a clot but you know that's got to be diagnosed so that takes time was it a clot was it a rupture or is it just a strided vessel but um there are some streptokinase there are some enzymes to be given to try to open you up but for the rupture that's not going to be an easy fix if you ruptured and have a hemorrhage um and and so that's what has to be decided um and a lot of times the, a quick is your retina and and if it looks like there's ruptures um then possibly it was a rupture spinal tap they'll do right away to see if it's if it's um a rupture because if the spinal fluid is red it's probably been a rupture um that's about it. I mean, that's what we medically nursing uh, the establishment does for a brain attack, and you see it isn't much. It's it's good nursing care is the best thing. Uh, now, if they're able to dis to open up a vein, I mean, an artery, that's great with a, a kinase or or something. If that can be open, that's a beautiful thing. So. That's great. A little bit of damage, but it was residual. A little bit of residual, and that's not going to be that big a deal. Um, if they can open up the striated vessel and before too much damage is done, that's, that's a good thing. The rupture is the worst because um, I just think of it as a hose of blood that's poured all over your nephron, uh, neurons. And that isn't the way that those neurons needed to get blood. And so it's drowned in them, so they're damaged. It's the worst of the three. It's the rupture of the cerebral. So, and if anybody, uh, uh, and I don't even know her name or the name of the book, but there was a Miss America, what, 30 years ago, who was young and vibrant and she's alive she wrote a book that's why i said i don't even know her book and I, you probably could google 
former Miss America who had a stroke. And But what is interesting, I've read excerpts from it in the magazines, and obviously not interested enough to read the book, but I got enough that I got the picture in magazine articles, and she tells that what it was like to have a, a stroke. Hers was a clot because she was on birth control pills. Well, she, I think it was a clot. She, her story was that um, it was Thanksgiving. She had a, a three-year-old or a six-year-old six and a brand-new baby a few months old and fixed the Monday before Thanksgiving. She went in to have her um, um, cervix biopsy because of atypical cells. You know, every, it's kind of like the common cold but because everybody has that atypical cells, I say everybody, but pretty much. As, as the doctor told me, it, your cervix is kind of like your nose. It's getting all the germs and they'll sit there and fester and so you get atypical cells. And so it's not um, too alarming to get them, but whatever, the doctor wanted to do a biopsy. And he did on a Monday she said she was under stress for Thanksgiving meal for the family. Had Thanksgiving meal Thursday, so a lot of pressure. Friday morning, she hears the baby crying, and she said, I started to get up and I couldn't. But her mind was okay, but she couldn't. And she said, so I wanted to tell my husband, I couldn't get up, but I couldn't talk. And she said, so she cried, and her crying woke him up. And they called the doctor, and the doctor said, I think it's just a repercussion of the biopsy. And he said he gave her till 9 o'clock in the morning. If she wasn't better, they were going in biopsy, crazy or not. And they did, and she'd had a, um, a brain attack. And she tells the saga of coming, of her rehabbing and what it was like. And she'd walk around, she had leaves in her hand. Said, when did I pick those up? She said, we'd watch a TV program and <clears throat> at intermission, I didn't even know what we were watching. And she had to learn to tie her shoe, just a uh, tennis shoe, along with her six-year-old. It, so it, it's, I used to be pretty hard on nurses and nursing uh, CVAs because they'd get contractures if it was bad. Now, barely, that's all right. But bad ones where they're contracting, I think nothing but a nurse did that to them, bad nursing. Until a refresher was in the class and she had a child that, for whatever reason, was bedridden and in contracted. And she said, I'm gonna tell you, youth and contractions are just hard to beat. And she said, I'm a nurse and I knew to do exercises with my child and I couldn't stay ahead of it. So after that, I do realize muscles that are strong and youthful or good are gonna strongly contract. She said, I could probably have done it every hour and I'd still get a contracture. So. I'm not as hard on CVAs that have contractures, but uh, it is a big nursing deal, stroke patients. Now, I spent a little too much time on that, but I had to. Um, I'm just telling you, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Of what? I hadn't heard a thing, Christine, but I, I, we need to read about it.
Yeah. And the well, that's good to know. And you know, I've seen children, they just put glob on them. Yeah, I know. Uh -huh. <laughs> fluoride toothpaste, yeah. Megan, she's saying fluoride toothpaste supposedly starts bleeding of the brain. Right, right, that's good. And um, a lot of people use uh, toothpaste that is natural. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, on, I just, this, another little thing. Um, hydrocortisol cream. Now, we, I'm on steroids today, but, you know, it, we take it, we rub it on us for itching, for urticaria, because it's got a steroid in it. And we know steroids are anti-inflammatory, so the itch is down, the inflammation's down, you've got poison ivy, whatever. And, but all you can get over the counter is 1%. If you ask your physician for some, it's, you're asking for a prescription, which is 2%. And a physician told me that Lamisil, and I think Lamisil, L-A-M-I-S-A, it's not a cortisol cream, I don't think, but he said, is it, he says it's as good as 2%. So I thought that was good to know and for you to keep in mind. He said, don't ask, tell people, don't bother with the 2%. Is Lamisil cortisol? That's it. It's antifungal. But he says it's just as good as 2% hydrocortisol. So that's just a little tidbit that he passed on to me. Uh, on your organization in the hospital, see I'm just jumping around, but I think I've told you, and, and I know um, uh, Krista and Sonia and I talked about it at one, third, at one, organizing in the hospital is one of the biggest deals. And I may have already gone with you, but if, if you're with me on a Monday, you'll see I push it because the students think they're smarter than I am on organization. They like their way. You know, this has worked for me. I said yes, and I've been doing it 50 years. So let you're not even a nurse, and let me try to push you to do it my way. They just are real stubborn in their ways. But 7, 8, 9, 10 an hour, 11, 12, 1, 2, and everything on that patient, you put your little note of what you need to do. Then you see an hour you don't have to do anything and that's when you could chart or whatever or give the bath or whatever you need to do. So hourly organization on anything I think is a good thing in nursing um, wherever you work. And so I wanted to say that. Um, universal precautions and, and uh, you know they're the gloves, the mask, the goggles and we're now to, again, my students use too much, too much gloves. And you say, is that possible with whoo, everything? Yes, it is possible. If I'm gonna take a, a IV bag and hang it up, they put gloves on. And I stop them and I'll say, you don't need gloves. You're not even with the paint. You're up here on a pump. And I'll, well, I just like to be protected. I said, from what? Well, <laughs> protection, it's just my thing. I just want to do it. I said, but it's filling landfills. They don't care, they don't care. And so we have, we have progressed on gloves. And I probably don't wear them as much as I should, but also I'm not sure I need to wear them as much as, I, as they do. I mean, the hospital does. Um, <laughs> This one student was just so obstinate Monday. She just said, I just do it for my protection. I j and I, I can do that if I think I need to be protected. And I said, yeah, and I tried to go through all the, I said, but 10 years from now, you're gonna hear me when you're running with your tongue out. It's one more thing to do. Get the gloves, put them on. And so we went in to empty her. She didn't know how to empty her. I beat her. Uh, 
urine after that, for urine bath. And she reached out and I said, now you can put gloves on her. <laughs> so what she needs to put it on, she doesn't. She said, well, I wondered. I said, yeah, it's an excrement. You're handling, or potentially. You get freaked her out and say, then why aren't you wearing the mask? Do what? You know, you could say, then how come you're not protected with the mask? Yeah, 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 right. Anyway, um, so when, what? Well, of course, anytime you're going to be around at the their secretions, you want to wear them. But friend, uh-huh. Like, you know, how many times do you stay washed? Like, you know, often, or maybe just using hand sanitizer all the time. What is your opinion? I... Well, I love soap and water, and um, if I have, I, I do a review it, because I come out of the room and I don't always wash, I, you have to do the phone when you come out of the room. Anybody that's with me, it's a, it, they'll be fined. Uh, it's like, it used to be $10,000 if OSHA's secretly making rounds and see us come out of the room, any of us, and don't foam out. But I've just, sometimes I've just washed my hands and I just don't want to foam again because I do think we absorb all this. So I'll fake it sometimes if my hands are really clean. <laughs> just hit it and don't hit it. So, um, if I, now if I go in, if I'm going to touch the patient and do things with the patient, I will wash my hands before I come out. But if I just go in and I do something at the pump, I don't think I need to. Now, somebody may have held the handle of the door that, see, I just think you need to think about it. And then also, the absorption of the chemicals. It's not just that I don't want real dry hands. I just, if I don't need to foam in, foam out, well, soap's going to do the same thing, but it doesn't stay on you too long. I don't know that I answered you, oh, Mandy. I, do what? Where you're storing the urine before or mm -hmm. So I, it's another reason I don't quite wash uh, foam as much as, as. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I, now I'm with you. The hand washing is what we're talking about. And, and. Yeah. Now, they'll whisper about you when they get in the hall, but you don't care. <laughs> and, and, you know, I've done with physicians, and I know they go out and talk about I'm not the worst at confronting them, but, um, you know, um, if it's a loved one and I don't think they're doing something, I, I know they're going to talk about me, but I don't care. And you have to get that mindset on some of that. And, um, yeah, they'll talk about you. Yeah, well, that's the the deal with that one um that's okay so yeah i don't like it either mandy when and the physicians really do in and out and don't and look and they'll touch and they don't have a uh, good and i'm gonna tell you um if for no other reason the patient and their family because i've I've heard, I was in a room one time and a student came in, I was visiting with the husband and the patient, and the student came in and went to the room and washed before she came in. I need to push that with them. And the wife started talking, she said, what we're talking about is that the first person I had seen come into this room and wash their hands. So it's pretty impressive. And do you know how much she shot up in the opinion of that patient? I need to tell the students that um, tomorrow. Um, and, and because the, the student was conscientious, I haven't pushed that, but I should because it's pretty impressive if they've gone in and done that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a hard one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And and they, the stethoscopes, yeah, because people do not wipe the disc. I don't much. So I think people are good about their ears. It's boring, but what does that do? Um, 
Yeah, I think so often we do um, uh, strain the gnat and swallow the camel, and it's a lot that we do in this <coughs> medical community. So, uh, excrement of any secretions, always gloves. Um, they want us to wear goggles, not even glasses, to empty the urine bag because of splatter. That's what they push. Most people don't. They just, uh, I don't because I can't find any goggles and I, I just don't. I could put these glasses on to change urine, but I'm just careful or turn my face if I think it's going to splatter. But so now, but any AM care, we used to not wear gloves. I do wear gloves during AM care. Um, and, and mouth care. When I was first a nurse and in school, they said, now don't put gloves on to do mouth care. They think you don't want to do their mouth. Well, that's, forget that. Uh, and pretty much the public has been educated that we need to wear gloves with them. So they're all right with it. So the universal precautions, gloves, mask, um, and, um, um, Gloves, mask, uh, and and um, hand washing. Um, let's see, something else I wanted to say on that. Um, uh, 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 um, well, I may think of it in a minute. And then, um, oh, oh yeah, I know what it was. Isolation is that, now that is one of the biggest strain a nap and swallow the camel we do in the hospital. Because if you had um, MRSA, MRSA, or um, what's the other one, BRE? BRE, but there's another one that everybody has. Um, or staff, just staff. In your urine 20 years ago, if you say yes on your admission, you get the works in your front door. The masks, the gowns, the gloves, because you've ever had it. And I go in and out of the room if I'm not going to touch the patient, if I want to give a bath or something like that. But it doesn't mean they have it now, but they think if they're sick, everything's broken down, defenses, and it's easy for that to reoccur or whatever. So uh, isolation has just gone crazy. And I don't know that we're any better at protecting than we were 20 years ago. Um, now, the nursing process, and I wanted to speak to that, um, you know, so that if you ever go to work and somebody says, so do you follow the nursing process? I want you to not blink an eye and say absolutely. And to review you, of course, the nursing process is that you assess, you notice it. You notice it, that's your assessment. And then what do you want to see instead of this? That's your goal or your objective. What I wanna see high in the sky, I tell the students, they say, it's no way it's going to happen. I said, but it's your, get in the habit of thinking the best you want. Then the third is intervention. What can I do to get the pie in the sky? Your interventions. And then the fourth and final step to the nursing process is evaluation. Can't do it? No way. Because of. So, assessment, Goal, how, what can I do as a nurse? The goal is the patient, and that's pretty important to realize. The goal is the patient, the intervention is the nurse, and then the evaluation. So often I'm in the line at the grocery store and I'll see wonderful veins, and I'll think, oh, it'd be good to do an IV on, you know, just <laughs> flashes. So I assessed, what I really want is a great IV. How do I do it? I get the supplies and I put the tourniquet on, I get my supplies, and then did it work? So the nursing, you walk in a patient's room. 
I have, I've had to testify in a, a couple of lawsuits, a couple of three lawsuits, and they would say something about evaluate, what did, or assess, or they don't use that word, but I say, we nurses do it all the time. And, and I've even said in, in uh, a trial, we assess all the time if we walk in a room and the patient calls us mama, whoops, I've made an assessment. I don't want them to call me mother. That's, I want them to call me nurse or know their mother by calling their mother. And how do I do it? By questioning, orienting, or whatever, and then did that work. Um, so yeah, we assess all the time. They've been on the right side. I don't want them to get, my goal is to not wear the skin out on the right side. What do I do? I turn them and evaluate the skin. So the nursing process. Now, um, I want to say a, just a little bit on nutrition. Um, you know, I sprinkle it along the course. Um, oh, yeah, I have something else here, too. Um, I'm going to talk a little nutrition when we get in diabetes. Um, everybody has their ideas on nutrition, whether you're um, buy all your produce from Farmer Todd down in the country or, or um, all natural products and how they might affect or not affect you. Um, and and um, vegetarian. Um, and, and people usually have done some study themselves and why they want to think like they do about food. And um, I think that's just people need to do what they feel is comfortable and how they feel best. Um, a few things. We've already talked vitamin C, and there's somewhere in your briefs or your agenda that, well, let's just see in briefs. I think there is a nutrition thing, isn't it? Yeah, page 22. Let's go in briefs to 22. It's not much, but now those natural diuretics, they see it's not a lot. Uh, those are things you can Google. You don't have to keep this. My students are doing it all the time because they're not used to thinking about food helping. But I want them to start thinking about it because it's a great teaching tool. If you go public health, um, you can try to get people to realize that a few um, foods work to diuresis. Um, so there are some of them. Now, the 21 healthiest foods and the 10 best fruits, 10 best vegetables, that and 10 power foods, those are somebody's opinion. And you can read something else and it's somebody else's opinion. I want to point out that uh, the best fruits. And I, everything shows that kiwi and guava are the number one most nutritious fruit. Look where citrus is. It's later down there. Isn't that interesting? Go to veggies and pretty much, now as far as number five, six, and seven, I don't know nor care too much, but uh, the best veggie is uh, kale and that's, I've mostly seen that. Um, see, there are all kinds of others and they're good, but they say, now remember, go to the next page on top sources of vitamin C. I know we may have already said the red bell pepper is the best vitamin C you can have. Green is second. And, and they're better, most people think citrus is high in C and it's good, but it's not um, the top. But remember on vitamin C, heat kills it and light kills it, and it has to be daily. 
daily. So, um, if you have vitamin C, say juice, in your refrigerator, the refrigerator's dark, and that's great, but if it's not covered, because it does need to be covered, um, and, and light is not good for it. I can't remember if I told you that uh, in, in my retirement years, I might crusade that the grocery stores, did I tell you, they bothers me that they keep and that the man said consumer so they know it they know that the light kills vitamin C so heat kills it so bell peppers that you stuff and cook to roast you've lost the C but you've got the flavor uh, power foods almonds are just always the, the nut that they like the best Others are okay, but they do love the almonds. The berries are popular. Uh, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries. They say organic's better in the berries because you don't have the uh, insecticides growing uh, on the skin and sitting there and all. Um, um, let's see. Oh, I have a dietitian friend that says berries just chase carbs and if you're going to do carbs eat some berries and they'll just detonate the carbs it's a interesting idea there we already iron sources and of course if you're going to eat iron you're going to do some vitamin C I hope and any dried fruits are high in iron um, and then you don't need to ever learn you could just Google, if you, someone takes Coumadin, they do need to watch vegetables. And I don't know how, you know, this kind of stuff, like foods that interfere with them, you know, I wonder how much it really takes to do that. They're alerting us so they don't get sued and all that stuff. Well, the doctor didn't tell me or whatever. I, I, I saw a woman at Whole Foods, she was just worried to death on her husband's diet and he's on Coumadin. I told her forget it. I said does he just eat just green vegetables all day long? You know because she was trying not to get this. <laughs> Dietary things I'm not even sure. Now I hate to say it but I think I will. That grapefruit is so bad. Have you read that? It, about every drug they don't want you to have grapefruit or grapefruit. Do what? And I wonder how much they all say how much you think it's pretty. Really? So you really believe that? Oh, Kathy. See, I'm up here making fun of it. Oh. <laughs> Kathy says grapefruit juice needs to kill him, Megan. Now, so Kathy, tell me again, it's doing what? Really? Um, how much, I wonder? Just a little? It all depends on each individual. But okay. But uh, one man that I know in particular was just having a couple of drinks a night and just started having all these problems. And it's just in his body every night. Mm -hmm. Well, I love grapefruit, and I'm on a statin drug, but I take that at night. So my doctor said, can you smoke grapefruit with your lunch in the morning? I think it's already been your diet. Okay. That's a good point. Do it in the morning and then take your drug. He was taking his, and so mm -hmm. I didn't yeah. have yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. That's good. Uh, you don't, I, those are just the high phosphorus. Uh, you don't need to know them. Again, high protein, though, are your animal ones. Uh, chicken and fish and red meat. And just keep in mind, as we said on the labs, the waste is less for the high quality proteins. And waste being nitrogen is their biggest. And so if it's high protein, you don't have quite as much waste. 
high purine, we've talked about that one, and um, gout, and we talked about gout, the uric acid waste that gets in your joints, earlobe, big toe, salt in the diet, oh my goodness, um, what, I've got it here, one teaspoon of salt is 2,300 milligrams of sodium. Now, if you never picked up salt shaker, they say you're already getting that um, because of canned and processed, frozen and processed. Um, but the uh, people are told, patients are, are told, low sodium diet, low sodium. Well, they don't know what you're talking about. So give them an idea just like that. If you ever work with somebody that's on a low sodium, let me tell you, you're getting a teaspoon of salt probably more, according to the diet, without touching the salt shaker. Uh, so just don't cook in it, don't do anything, and you're getting your teaspoon, but your body needs it. Now, I heard that, oh, uh, is it, uh, I better not say, because I can't remember the uh, element, that if you salt, maybe y'all heard, if it's not the sodium as bad as its counterpart, what, phosphorus? That if you're not getting enough phosphorus, there's where the heavy salt comes in. Is that ringing any bell with anybody? Potassium? Potassium. Is it potassium? You think it's potassium? If the potassium. If you're getting enough potassium, they say the salt isn't as bad. Have you heard that too? So if you love salt, then um, make sure you're getting enough potassium. And potassium's in what all? Well, you know, bananas, uh, Irish potatoes, what else? Green vegetables, fish and chips. Uh -huh. um, there's your natural antibiotics. And then calcium, I know, I don't even know what norm calcium, but I do, I'm very conscious of, which I think everybody should be, of a serving. And a serving is 300 milligrams. And pre-menopausal women, we need, we, I'm not pre-menopausal, <laughs> 1,200 um, milligrams. Post-menopausal need 1,500. Um, and, and you need it 500 in eight hours. I mean, in five hours, five, five. Keep in mind, 500. If you give, you take your whole 1,500, it doesn't absorb. The body best absorbs about 500 in five hours. So that's why you might, if you were postmenopausal, take a 750, um, or whatever and a 750 at night and then you've got the night and the whole day for it to absorb um, but a serving you don't need to do 1500 if you're doing a serving of calcium and that's a glass of milk or the green vegetables and all those so that's good um, I don't know whether I've told you uh, Raw, so often the raw vegetables are best for us, but they say uh, cooked carrots nutritionally are better for us than raw carrots. You know, raw carrots have a lot of sugar. I mean, if you taste them, they're sweet. They're good, I think. A lot of sweet. Um, um, let me see what else I want to say. I think we all know that it goes back and forth whether it's good to drink coffee or not but um, the going thing now is too much interferes with iron absorption but they then say it's good to have a little coffee so again as I say you can just read all kinds of contradictory things um, I'm going to talk a little bit more when I get into diabetes about diets. Um, 
they say vinegar, the, the effects of vinegar are so wonderful. If you can palate it, you know, it makes you gag, I think. Um, a couple of teaspoons twice a day. Blood sugar rises after we eat, but studies have shown that vinegar can inhibit rising blood sugar. Um, do what? Oh, really? Yeah, so you wouldn't have to. Good. Um, um, nothing, you know, we don't have much to fight our viruses. They say grape juice. Grape juice um, helps with viruses. I'm not sure if it, if it kills. I don't think it kills. I think it makes the Malu in the area better. Um, or not as, the virus can't last as long with if you're taking in grape juice. Again, how much? I don't know. And I don't know that anybody knows. Um, is there anything, and I'm not through with nutrition, but um, does anybody have, I don't want a lot of time, but a Quickie on why you are a veg uh, vegetarian or not. Or, I mean, if it's religious, that's one thing. Uh huh. I, um, I say um, dairy, meat, or processed foods with sugar, which has a lot of anti inflammatory products for arthritis. Uh -huh. And it really, because I have had to take any medication um, since I've been on it. So it's almost vegetarian. Well, but no, no dairy. No dairy, no eggs. Wow. And it's your anti-inflammatory syndrome or something. Right. And right. taking off those, you're not as inflamed for arthritis. Right. My doctor said if I want to in a few months, I can add in eggs or some chicken and fish just one at a time to see if it doesn't affect me. Again. It's okay, but initially just taking off all of it, and it made a tremendous. And a physician, what kind of physician is that? He's just, because um, <laughs> well, I didn't know they ever went for food, that you know. Was just my primary care physician, but he said he learned about that from a rheumatologist. That it oh, was okay. <laughs> yeah, a rheumatologist, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he, he accepted it, which so often they don't, uh, physicians don't push food, I don't think, because they know it that much. Um, I have an autoimmune disorder, and then it's the mess, and my doctor put me, told me about gluten free, and then we had those two of vitamin D. And that did it. Uh, so, inclined to MS, did you say? Yes. It mimics MS. MS. I take it and, uh, and you're saying, <laughs> you're saying high D and gluten free helps that. Um, it took all my inflammatory in my spine and it was just gone. I know when I've gotten medicine because my spine aches. I'm telling you, the inflammatory aspect of our bodies is unbelievable. And we don't know why it gets triggered or we do something about it. But those are examples of the inflammatory aspect. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. In the old days, they didn't, they just didn't have anything to say about diet, in the, you know, years ago. Um, I'll share, anybody else chime in, but I will share, we're going to go to diabetes now. Um, and along the way, I may have some more nutrition, and you can throw in something too, like the fluoride, Christine, or you know, any of those, and we can decide if we believe them or not. Um, or want to. It's so hard to change habits, isn't it? It's hard. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yes, if you see the results, quite a help. Well, they say gluten here is because of the processing now. In the old days, it didn't have all those. We might eat to the same night. Food that I bring here is if 
That's fascinating, isn't it? Do what? I have a friend who orders her flowers from Europe and she couldn't make it for her daughter who has celiac disease. She makes her own bread and she's fine. Wow. Oh my. And they think it's what, Ann? That I think it's because of genetic Gluten. We're talking about genetically modified. Do what? Genetically modified yeah. things in the yeah. food supply that they eat now that go along shelf life mm -hmm. and transfer. You know, strawberries will sit somewhere for three weeks after they're picked and it's almost like they're in the fridge. Oh, yeah. yeah. See, so genetically God adjusted. Will his sweet potato and a whole potato and a regular potato and put them both on the shelf on different counters to see what happens to the two. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really? So one that's not organic may sit there for a month and never sprout. The organic thing will just keep doing that. Too. In potatoes, sweet potatoes, you're saying? Just regular red potatoes or sweet potatoes. Yeah. yeah. That's good. That's good to know, yeah. And this was, and I washed them really yes. well before I started having blisters, and I didn't care. And I, I was amazed. Yeah. 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 And you know. We were, we were of that mind, but one was like the same thing, but yes, I. And you just don't it. think celery, you know, I see it in the store, and I see the organics <coughs> fabulous looking. Yeah. Well, this a non-organic looks fine, too. It looks but. exactly. They look the same, really, the bunches. They look the same. Do you think, now I think, and I may be wrong, I think I can tell a difference in organic broccoli's flavor versus non-organic. Sweet potatoes too, do you think? And can you tell any difference in the celery, or is it just water anyway? Oh, Good to know. Yeah. Yes, and it is. I mean, it's going to cost smaller. Yeah. Um. Now, I want uh, diabetes. Oh, let, no, I'm not quite ready for diabetes. We've done hepatitis. I know. Now my memory's not that bad. We've done hepatitis, and I talked about it. But I found some data that I hadn't shared with you that I wanted to. And it was, um, we talked about A. I told you that's, they're all viruses that just do havoc to the, to the kidney, to the liver. And we said A is the one that uh, feces goes in the mouth. And all the others are, are uh, blood or semen. And that's true, but, um, and, and I was, this article just really enhanced the work of uh, the liver. And I just don't think we get enough credit. Um, as it said, it removes poisons, it cleans bacteria, cleans bacteria, produces clotting factors, and other proteins. And um, it, it's just what an organ our liver is. So we know about A, incubation on the virus for the incubation to start affecting the liver is about 20 to 30 days. It's about a month after you've been exposed. And you know, A does not have, A doesn't have a vaccine. We have antibodies that can try to fight it, um, but um, we don't have a vaccine. Where 
all the others, B, C, D, E, all um, are, are from the blood and the, the semen. Um, let me see, there was something else I wanted to say. Um, and they're not, what I have to say is not, that may have been it. Oh, of course, B and C are not the same, but they're transmitted the same. And a body fluid, and, and you get them by the blood and semen there. Um, we have the vaccine, though, for... Do we have it for B and C, don't we? And then now, of course, we have the drug. And we talked about that last week. Um, I guess that's all I wanted to say. I, I just wanted you to know that it goes all the way to E. A, B, C, D, E, and there may be some more. Now, diabetes and... Um, some of it, because I, it's hard to, it, it's the to me the most overall invasive problem, because babies have it, pregnant women have it, elderly have it, psychiatric patients have it, everybody can have diabetes, and um, and and we've already talked about A and B, and. Um, and I, I think I gave you all the film that, um, or I told you about that film, Enough Glory for Everyone. And it's an Alistair Cook film, and I think I told you, um, that you go, just when you want to watch, you think, I mean, I took it to a vacation with my family, my family at Christmas one time told them I had it, nobody was interested, but I made them, and they loved it, because it is a great movie on the discovery of insulin, and, and it so um, makes you such so mindful of insulin and um, discovery and how great it is to have it. Um, um, so, with that you know already, and I think I've mentioned bits and pieces of what I'm going to say. I've already said some bits and pieces, but I'm just going to do it all again. Um, I've told you the uh, sugar is like glass, and it's in our bloodstream, and and that a dietitian was telling me that. So when it scrapes your nephrons, um, it makes them inflamed. You know, inflammation, and it even keeps our veins inflamed. Uh, the inflammation in a diabetic is high, um, and if you want to graphically think of it as slivers of glass that are in the bloodstream, if that helps you, and, and that it's going to cause inflammation because it scrapes against sides, if that helps you, do it. I, we've already talked about lisinopril, and I just want to remind you again, ACE inhibitors. Lisinopril, because it's so cheap, um, is the drug that can, if given, for lisinopril for blood pressure, if given to a diabetic, helps protect their nephrons from the glass in the nephrons, keeping the inflammation, the pressure, and all that. And just... Sidebar, remember, you can be on it for five, six years, however long, and one day you may be allergic to it. And how do I know? Because I feel numb, facial numbness of some kind. Um, now, and then I've already told you, just to remind you, if you think of the sugar as coal, coal, and you're stoked in the furnace, furnace being your muscles, <clears throat> we've got to get the coal into the furnace, and that's through insulin. So insulin is your shovel. You're shoveling coal into the muscle, and the shovel is insulin. Um, now, they didn't know that for years. 
<clears throat> a lot of years. They can go back, and these again, bits and pieces I think I've told you, but they can go back to mummies and realize this body had high blood sugar and it probably killed them. So it has been around since man, uh, this business of the body being overrun with high blood sugar. Um, so all these years, nobody knew what to do about it. In 1891, so it's just before the 19, 1900, 1891, <clears throat> a German, and I, I don't remember his name, but he came up with the idea that it was the pancreas was the problem. So that wasn't until 1890s that they isolated it to the pancreas, which is kind of amazing. But that's all he knew. And he didn't know islets. Because, you know, we talked about, we've already talked about, it's two organs. The islets secrete insulin, but the rest of the bo uh, body secretes digestive enzymes, which go through a duct to the GI system. But we're just talking about the islets of the pancreas. But they didn't know that. It didn't even know it in, until um, it was 1891 or 1890s. And so the 1900s come and Frederick Banting, <clears throat> who was a Canadian, and I'm not sure how much of all this I told Well, I think I told you when you see The Glory for Everyone, it's a movie on him and his discovery of insulin. He's a Canadian farm boy and uh, always wanted to go to medical school. And he did. And just as he got out, World War I happened, 1918. He went to war and was a surgeon in one of the MASH setups. That didn't appeal to him. If you can picture him, he stuttered and wore double glass, lens glasses and um, so that didn't appeal to him. He went back to Canada and wanted to set up practice in the city. And so he did. And I think I either read or Alistair Cook in the, mo in the movie, his first month or two, he brought in $4. And he realized he needed more than that. So he went to campus of the university, the medical school, and ask if he could do part-time. He didn't want full-time because it would interfere with his practice, but he wanted part-time. Well, of course, they gave him the worst lecture there is because nobody wanted diabetes because nothing's been done since 1890s and nothing has been known about it all the centuries, 1800s. Nobody's known. So he got the lecture and he had the time, so he, he decided to do some experiments. But I have to tell you, at the time, they've got sanitariums that are just pristine over the world <laughs> working on this very thing because it's, it's pretty important. <coughs> Centuries people have been dying of high blood sugar. And so here at this adjunct professor at a Canadian medical school gets that assignment and so he he got a list of things he wanted and he took it to his dean and he said I, I need a lab I'd like to have two medical students to help me and I need about several Bunsen burners and I need a few dogs because he wanted to isolate the pancreas and so the dean, his name was McLeod. Dean McLeod got him, let him have an attic office, got him some buns and burners and a few dogs, but he said, nobody, I can't get a medical student that wants to work with you. Not that he only just didn't want to do it. <laughs> but finally, two medical students decided to break the time in two and help half time. And that worked, and the medical student was best, B-E-S-T. If you are trivia, you know Banting and Best discovered uh, insulin. And it's just fascinating 
They worked in the lab. They ran through the dogs pretty fast. Uh, they <clears throat> stray dog. And they, <laughs> if that matters, <laughs> don't get upset. They were strays. <laughs> oh, you're glad about that. <laughs> anyway, um, so they knew from the German that it was the pancreas, but what? And they took the pancreas out, and of course the dog, leave the dog alive, but he couldn't live long without his pancreas. But they um, would grind it up. They put it in solvents. They tried to inject. They tried everything with the pancreas they could think of. And the dogs would die or you know, they just couldn't get any handle on anything. They, it was about nine months they worked, and they tried. And they did realize that, oh, they, they did things like tie off the ducts that went into the GI system, and the patient still got them. So something, and they don't really realize it's two organs, islets and digestive enzymes. So they cut off, clamp off the digestive enzyme duct. That didn't, they could see that. They clamp off the blood. Well, they can't do that because the, that's where insulin's passing. It was just a, a, a series of, of mishaps. Just didn't work. He had to get the light and go out and try to find stray dogs to work with. But finally, they did realize, microscopically or whatever, that there were some bubble, uh, bubbling spots on the pancreas. So they aspirated and injected a, a dog that was diabetic because they had cut, uh, clamped off his, his um, uh, pancreas or they'd done something that the pancreas was not getting insulin or producing insulin. <clears throat> so they clamped all that off. So he's in a diabetic state. They injected him and went to lunch. And when they came back, he was running around. And that was their big um, epiphany. But what do you do with it? I mean, so they extracted, but can humans, can you do that to him? How can you do that to humans? And then how much is it going to take for a 100-pound person versus a 40 pound dog. So all those were were going on. He shared that with the dean and they injected, they decided to take the uh, extract from the dog and put it in a patient. And that was nine months after the day they started. And I'm telling you, it was a patient in the hospital with diabetes. It didn't even phase the patient, the blood sugar. It didn't take. So they're very discouraged, and they don't, they're trying different things, but they're getting nowhere. They do know that when they gave it to the dog, he was over his diabetes for a little while, but we know you can't just be quit. You have to keep getting. So um, this arrogant medical student came into their lab and told them, informed them. <clears throat> that he, the dean, had shared with him. He was actually the, the second medical student was gonna take over from Best. And I guess because Best stayed with Banting, the dean thought, well, I'll share with you. They're doing some good work and they didn't want to swap with you. He injected a patient with the extract and the patient was doing beautifully. And Banting and Best were just killed and, and that's why the name of that film is Enough Glory for Everybody. They tried to realize altruistically that we're doing it for human, for human, for mankind. We're not doing it for glory. This is a thing that mankind needs. So they tried to get in that mode. And, but the man was very arrogant. He said, as we speak, the patient is out of their diabetic coma and da 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 da. So all he knew was this extract from the animals. But as Alistair Cook says, he broke the absolute, he was a biomedical 
student broke the cardinal rule of biochemistry, and that is that you take meticulous notes, and he didn't, so he couldn't repeat it. He didn't know how to repeat it. So now they're all on the same level again, and Vantage and Bess came up with the right combination to give a patient. And they called it the extract. Um, <clears throat> now, at that same time, uh, the vice president under Calvin Coolidge for the United States was uh, Charles Evans Hughes, Vice President Hughes, very wealthy, and had a home in the Hamptons and one in Bermuda, and then a place in D.C. And but he had and he had two daughters, and um, the nine-year-old, I think she was about nine. Uh, Elizabeth had diabetes and they were very wealthy the Hughes so they could put her in a sanitarium for diabetics you know like the TB used to there were TB sanitariums they put her they had the money to put her into um, it was New England it was some sanitarium in New England just for diabetics and that's what's fascinating those sanitariums for diabetics, and you know, you weren't poor if you were there. And what they did, now this is, um, this is, well, she was in a sanitarium when Dr. Banting was in World War One, So it was like 1918. He discovered insulin in 21. So she was able to keep her life you know, it, with the help of a sanitarium, go home, come back. The sanitariums, they knew this. They knew exercise helped. They knew you couldn't live forever on just exercise, getting the sugar into the muscle. They knew that much. They knew carbs. And, and so they kept, they really monitored at the sanitarium the carb level. So they knew that. They knew carbs make sugar and that you've got to watch those carbs and, uh, of course, watch sugar. Um, and they knew exercise. That's about what they knew at this point. So Elizabeth Hughes is in the sanitarium. And I always say what wealthy people sometimes do if they spot a good somebody in a field, you know, a restaurant. If somebody's great in a restaurant, you're, you're, I act like I know what I'm talking about. I hadn't done it, but I know it's happened. You have a great white restaurant waitress and you need a help at home, you hire her. And well, they do that in the hospitals or those kind of places too. Here's a great nurse they're impressed with. They've got the money. They asked, she was the best nurse in the sanitarium to come be private duty to Elizabeth, and she did. And they decided, sending Elizabeth to Bermuda, to their home in Bermuda, with the mist of the ocean and the sunshine, maybe that would help the diabetes. I mean, you know, you were groping at anything. So the nurse took, takes her to Bermuda, and the nurse can, she's so good, she knows the food, she knows the exercise, because she's been at the sanitarium. No good. Elizabeth just loses weight, loses weight. And, and of course the family would visit. But finally, the nurse wrote the family and said she's just deteriorating. And um, she wants to come home and die at home. So they brought her home, but the family put her in the sanitarium. Um, because they couldn't, they don't know what to do with her. They could keep the nurse with her, but so she goes to the sanitarium, and the wife, Mrs. Hughes, of the vice president, said, I hear there's a Canadian that has an extract. And the head of the sanitarium said, Well, you know, it's being, it's not perfected, and, and it's not in pharmaceutical. Available. It's not a pharmaceutical availability. And she said, I don't care. Would you write me a letter of introduction? And the head of the sanitarium said he would. So she went to Canada. And 
by that time, so this is right after, it's probably 1922, Dr. Banting is going to slaughterhouses at night and getting the pancreases of, they say just cattle, I've, I've heard pigs, yeah, pigs and cattle. And you know, I don't know whether you're too young, but our insulins were from cat, cattle and the pigs and all. Now it's humulin, it's made in the, in the lab as near to human, humulin, like human, and we're not using the insulin from animals so much now. I think there's still some out there. Anyway, so he would get that. You can imagine how crude the insulins were. And people would line up uh, just forever to see him that day to get a shot of his extract. So Mrs. Hughes met, meets with him and she said she, her daughter can't even walk. She's 40 pounds. She lies in the fetal position. And Dr. Banting said, the problem with helping you is I'll get, um, it'll get rumored that your money and your husband's position is what made it for you. And I don't want to risk that, that I'm a, I'm a doctor for the wealthy. And she said, uh, he said, people have been waiting, have walked four miles to see me today. I can't push you to the front of the line. She said, Dr. Banning, my daughter can't even walk. She can't even walk. And um, whatever she did, he finally relented and decided to treat Elizabeth. And uh, Alistair Cook's film says, in four months, he, she was his poster child. He took her everywhere showing slides and things to show Elizabeth. And I, I don't think, I, did, I, I hadn't seen the movie. I was in Green Hills Library for some reason and as I walked out on the reading table was Sir Frederick Banting. And it hit, oh, Banting, Banting and Bans. I wonder if that's Frederick Banting. So I checked it out and so, I read the book and it was great and then Alistair Cook came out with Enough Glory for Everyone and it's pretty much exactly uh, the same. The book doesn't tell about Elizabeth Hughes. Alistair Cook says, and this is to me one of the most important parts of the story, uh, he says that um, Elizabeth Hughes lived to 74 years of age and they think she received probably 44,000 shots of insulin. And that was crude. That was crude insulin. And uh, she died of heart failure. But that doesn't, I mean, that's 74 is good. Um, but um, I think the most impressive thing is it doesn't say she died as a double amputee, <laughs> you know, which it could have been. Um, 60, uh, 60 years she was a diabetic who did that well. So now, one other, oh, there's a book out, and let me see the year. Ten, so it's been out nine years. I didn't realize that. And the name of it is Breakthrough, colon, semicolon, Elizabeth Hughes, The Discovery of Insulin. And I have not read it. Uh, but I was, you know, I read the one on Banting, and I've seen the movie. But I thought this, I was reading over this today, and I thought, you know, I need to go to the library and see if that's in there. But, and, and it start this uh, review says, the word miracle is one of the most overused in our language and so often engenders a skeptical reaction. But if ever there was a medical miracle, the discovery of insulin, and it's rendering into a form deliverable to human beings is up there at the top. Um, um, this I didn't know, and apparently this book brings up. There was disappointment that the Vice President of the United States did not um, emphasize the importance of this event. 
and they think it's because of the animal cruelty or just what Dr. Banton said, because he was wealthy, it worked for him because he had the wealth to go to Canada and so forth. But it was not a big blitz in the United States. Doctor, oh, and they said that he also, uh, there was one dog that really had the most experimenting with, and the dog's name was Marjorie. And Dr. Banting, let's see, um, Banting sensitively euthanized Marjorie uh, after she had rendered uh, all these services that were critical to his discovery. So she was so close to Dr. Banting's heart that they said Vice President Hughes named every dog after that Marjorie because she was the reason that his daughter had life. Um, let me see, I think that, oh, then Dr. Banting went on. Oh, they offered him the Nobel Prize for medicine and no Canadians usually won that. Well, but they wanted him to split it, not with best, but with the dean of the school. So he said, no, I'm not gonna take it, he did. He gave, him some, he gave him some Bunsen burners in an attic room. So he said, I'm not going to take it. But Canada so rarely gets one, a Nobel Prize in medicine. They begged him to take it. So he said, I'll do it, but I'll share the money with Best. And in 19, not sure the year, 1922 or three, he won the Nobel, Nobel Prize. And the prize was $40,000. And Doc, uh, Dean McLeod rides that boat over there to Stockholm or wherever they give him, and he went on stage and got it. Banting wouldn't go, but he got his 20,000. McLeod got his 20, and he gave 10 to Best. Um, so he won the Nobel Prize. They, the word is, not to us, but that his contribution to um, Um, mm -mm, I wanted to say, not air, um, anaerobic and aerobic. Anaerobic and aerobic medicine, you know, the, uh, what, the um, uh, air versus not air. His contribution to that study was almost as significant in Britain as his discovery of insulin. And so he made quite a name for himself in the study of aerobic and anaerobic um, procedures or incidents or illnesses and was killed in World War II, Dr. Banting was, in an airplane crash. Isn't that too bad? Now, with that idea and appreciation for the discovery of insulin, um, we now, um, when it was made out of cattle, I think I've already mentioned this, cattle and pigs, we had to rotate because the, we're giving the body an antigen and the body does not accept antigens, it makes an antibody. And so uh, we had to, and in my lifetime, maybe yours, we had to rotate where we gave insulin. But see, it's human light now we don't have to rotate. Um, the only reason we do, and we, we, we do some, and the only reason is Vanderbilt had a study that, uh, and, and I, I've always heard the gate theory that your body gets used to something and likes it that way. And so, I don't know whether you learned the gate theory in pain, that if you, if, if something blocks that pathway from the pain to the brain, the brain doesn't know you have pain. And that's that, uh, yeah, the gateway. Well, they say that, and the body loves regularity. So, Vanderbilt did a study and said, let's, let's give insulin the same place all the time, and it'll be more effective 
now that we don't make antibodies for it. Because if you did it, they get lumps. They would get lumps, so it wasn't going to absorb good because it's going through so much uh, firmness. So Vanderbilt said, go an inch from the umbilicus the first day of the month and go seven one inches around the umbilicus the first week. Second week, go two inches out. The third week, go seven. Third week, go three inches and around. And fourth week, four inches and around. Then start over. That the body loves that, that pathway to stay and not do all that. Um, that's fine. Mostly the hospital just gives it in the arm. You can do all that if you want to, and that's fine, but the hospital doesn't say now, does it? Are you the second week or the third week to give it? We don't do that. So, but they think that does good. Uh, they have that little, you know, hypoglycemia uh, is the worst, uh, yeah, the worst, because the brain has to have sugar. And, um, and that's what keeps the neurons alive is some sugar so if we don't and we're real hypoglycemic it'll kill the brain cells um, so the worst of, of the high and low the worst is the low uh, the high can go into coma uh, and uh, you can go into the coma but it's not going to kill the cells um, I used to try to, uh, early days, try to keep the symptoms of both separated. I couldn't, I tried enough to. You know, they've got wonderful things, hypoglycemia, some of the symptoms, hyper. Mm -mm. If you'll just know that somebody feels different and um, uh, it's not the right feel. If they don't feel right, then let's find out. It, it's gotta be hypo or hyper and pretty much you'll know. If they've not had anything to eat and they took insulin, you know it's hype, a hypo, and the brain cells are a scare. Um, if you know they've eaten, it's probably hyper. Um, and then the little phrase, I was, before y'all came, I was trying, I never learned it, and my students are the ones that taught it to me, so it's not in there great. Uh, if sugar's high, y'all know it. Uh, sugar's high, you're hot and dry. Sugar's low, you need candy. That isn't right. It's it <laughs> right. <laughs> oh yeah, cold and clammy. Did I say it? Oh, oh, in the movie. So do I really? Well, good. <laughs> So tell us again, tell us again, Jennifer. Tell us. Cold and dry. Yeah. Hot and dry. Sugar's high. Cold and clammy. Thank you. So good. <laughs> Quote me. I've never been been so good with it. Uh huh. That is, and she was morally embarrassed because of you know. Isn't that but that's something? How it in her. Isn't that really crazy? That she didn't realize that she really had what was wrong. Really? Really? And she's going away. And I mean, that's what they were other trainers like, oh, you're wrong. You know, you're wrong. Like, you know, and then she was like, oh, yeah, you know, she was like, oh, yeah, you know, and then afterwards she was like, oh, Isn't that funny? Mandy, have you seen the movie, Alistair Cook's no. movie? You, you need to see it. She would love it. I love it. And my family ended up loving it to watch it. I've read articles. Yeah, yeah. What about Breakthrough? 
Uh-uh. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, well, I'm not through, so we're going to have to overflow to next time. Um, I will tell you, and I'd be interested what they're telling you, Mandy. Um, in my life of 50 years as a nurse, we've gone from if they're low, I mean, if they're, yeah, if they're low, we uh, would give them orange juice with two packs of sugar. Well, that went away. They want us to give them milk. And then that's gone away. And in the hospital, I'm talking about, now we just do orange juice. If you're out in the public, the word I'm told, just get sugar in them. Now, what do, you, what do they tell you, Mandy? Anything? She carries around her little sticky thing of hers that she holds for the one. Yeah, which has... Yeah. Yeah. Basically, yeah. she just likes these little things that she does. Ever, all the kids know, And really, and something and quick. Quick. And then the peanut butter, it, the cracker is good for that. All right. Now, I don't think anybody's staying with me, are you? I mean, you can if you want to. But. All right. So, Megan, we're through.